Hi everybody tuning in. This is our weekly Q&A session. Um, so it's a slightly different um, time today because Christian Miller, our uh, guest, he is in um, Cairns, so he's on uh, Australian Eastern time. So if we did it at our normal 7pm, then it would be uh, in the middle of the night for him. <laughs> so this is a bit more appropriate timing for everyone. Um, so as always, uh, feel free to submit questions as we go in the comments. Christian will be joining us in a minute. So he's a uh, photographer. Um, his photos are absolutely beautiful. You can check out his uh, profile as well. Um, and he is a conservationist and uh, he's the, one of the directors of the Cairns Turtle Hospital as well. Um, Christian, I've just seen you joined. You should be able to just select um, you should be able to request to join the video. Um, and yeah, so uh, it will be a really interesting one. We've had lots of questions uh, sent in, so we're going to try and get through them all. If we don't get th through them all, sorry in advance, um, there were quite a lot. Um, but we will do our best. Uh, and we've obviously got our fun quick fire questions at the end as well. Um, so hopefully Christian will join us in a minute. Um, uh, Christine, if you cut, if you're having any problems, just put a message on here, and um, we can either restart the live if we need to, or um, exit and re-enter. Um, but yeah, so feel free. There we go. Got it. Uh, let's wait for the internet to load. Hopefully, it will hold. There we go. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me okay? I can. Can you? Great. Yes, that's so good. The internet is working. <laughs> yeah, Technology, yeah. eh? <laughs> How are you? I'm good. So it's a bit dark here. So I turned the lights on. <laughs> just, that's just. Good. No, <laughs> um, okay, so do you want to start by just introducing yourself and telling us a bit about um, what you do? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Christian. And, uh, you know, what do I do? I, it's, it's almost a hard question. So I basically, I do whatever is necessary to help the oceans. You know, I, I'd say that's my, that's a very clear um, sort of life message for me. But that's what I do, whatever is necessary. You know? and, and in that respect, I did find, you know, somewhat my superpower. Like, what, what can I do? to support, to support others or to support the ocean directly or to support animals directly, whatever is necessary. Yeah, that's, that's in a way what I do. And photography was one of those that I had a given talent and I, I felt and I, you know, I realized that I have an impact and, and I can do something. So that, that's in a, in a nutshell, I would say what I am. Nice. Okay, and then just for people tuning in who might not know uh, who I am or what Love the Oceans is, um, we're a marine conservation organisation, so we're based out in Mozambique, and we are working to establish a marine touched area here, so everything we do kind of aims towards that, so we do a lot of different areas of research, um, so fisheries research, humpback whales, coral reefs, ocean trash, uh, marine megafauna, so whale sharks, manta rays, and then we also do two community outreach projects, teaching swimming and um, teaching marine resource management. So um, that's what we would normally be doing. But obviously COVID has changed the landscape a lot in, well, in every world, but the conservation world as well. Um, so we aren't able to do everything that we would normally be doing. So um, we've started these Q&A sessions to invite amazing guests like yourself on and uh, have a chat about conservation. Um, so that's us in a nutshell. Uh, if you're okay with it, should we just jump straight into the questions that have been submitted? Yes, let's go. Let's do it. Awesome. Okay, so the first question, an easy one. Uh, how did you get into your current role? An easy one, did you say yeah. that? <laughs> um, it, look, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy. And I, I don't want to, like, how, how much time do we have for that, for that answer? <laughs> but, yeah. I'd say, look, uh, and in a way, you know, if, you know, if for people that are listening, they're thinking, well, how do you get into um, you know, conservation? A lot of people are asking me that. And you know, one of the biggest challenges at first was how to be free in a way to be where you need to be. You know, if there's an issue, 
you know, how can you have the free, if you have a job it's going to be very difficult you know, yeah. uh, to open doors so that was my biggest challenge is to let loose of a job and be my own boss you know and, and that's easier said than done and at that time you know when I really got into it full time I was a dive instructor you know working pretty much you know full time uh, in all sort of different countries and um, obviously that that's where my love came from but I had to let loose of that and get from that and follow my passion and there was a couple of little coincidences that led me to be able to do that and one of which is my artistic background and I started designing some just silly t-shirts and sold them in the tourism industry until I was able to support me and my family through that and that's when I could you know cut the umbilical cord to the working world and I could just yeah. basically be free. And then that's when I started to create an impact. And that's when so many doors opened and they, they keep opening. So simply because I'm free and I keep myself free. Mm. So I can be somewhere. If there's someone calls me tomorrow and says, Christian, there's a problem in Brazil. You know, the first day, see you in two days. Not now in the COVID-19 situation, but, you know, in a normal situation i'd be there in a blink of an yeah. eye yeah oh so I flexibility but in the, in the end, that's the hardest i suppose yeah yeah um and your current roles like you, you, well you have many roles um so you're a director of the uh turtle Kent's turtle hospital as well um, i'm not any not anymore oh, okay. No, okay i did little I did let loose of that um, just because it didn't need me anymore. You know, it was, it is where it needs to be. There's so many good people involved. So many people want to be involved. Uh, you know, the fundraising goals have been met. You know, messages, it's, it's basically, it's established. I, I had That's awesome. nothing, mm -hmm. nothing to add. So I, yeah. I focused, I withdrew from that and focused on Parley, which is another story. Yeah. That's awesome. For people that don't know, um, can you explain a bit about Parley and what that is? Well, Parley is a, is a, a global organization. That's what I, I kind of felt. Look, with a turtle hospital, it, it was great. And, you know, it taught me a lot. And a turtle can be, in a way, like an almost like a vehicle, you know, to grab people's attention and emotions, to, to look at the bigger picture. And that's not just to save that turtle. It's about saving its habitat, you know, the oceans. Um, mm. You know, if you have one turtle, uh, you kind of not really having a, a big impact on that one animal. You do, but not the population. Uh, so yeah. with Parley, it's really the the interesting thing is the global approach, and it's just that the big thinking. And the founder of Parley was Cyril Gurdjieff. He, he's just his his mastermind. You know, he's got this this way of thinking really, really big. And I felt like I need I need that um, to make a much bigger impact. And one of our key missions is to solve the plastic issue, to eliminate plastic off the planet. You know, mm -hmm. and there's different stages to that. There's, you know, the stage where we're currently at is to intercept, to, you know, take the plastic out of the environment, uh, work with industry partners to inspire new products and inspire sort of that bridge uh, to mm -hmm. create new materials, new products, uh, and to really invest into the future of creating a, the, the new material that doesn't harm the planet. You know, especially yeah. not the oceans and marine life. So, you know, that's that's what Parley really does, and it does it really well. And the beauty is, there's so many great people involved. You know, so many yeah. inspirational individuals. If it be artists, scientists, if it be surfers, if it be sports people, you know, industry leaders. Like it, like the list is just so long, and it it just it really needed that. It needed bringing these people together that would never usually sit on one table. Yeah. And yeah. That's where past is really good at. Yeah. Global movement. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question was, when was the moment you decided to get involved in conservation? Um, was there a trigger event? There was a trigger. Um, and look, I grew up in Germany. You might hear that accent. Um, you know, I, I, I basically left Germany. I traveled and became a dive instructor. And then my first job, so I started in the Caribbean. And until then, I, I was so blunt in a way. I, I did not know that the oceans could be in trouble. I, I did not know of any, anything, literally. You know, and I had to realize 
um, and I worked in a country in Dominican Republic, and there were a few, a lots of you know the biggest all-inclusive resorts one after the other, and the ocean was almost empty. I haven't seen that before. You know, there was barely any fish. It was a highlight once every six months to see like a ray, maybe you know something. Wow. It was, and I needed that for you know to. And to keep the fire going. So anyway, mm. so there was in front of one hotel. There was a a cage in the ocean, like ten by ten meters. And inside that cage or net, there were like dozens of rays and sharks and things that I have not seen there anywhere in the wild. It was all in that little yeah. cage. So tourists pay money, swim around that net, and have seen these things. And I just wow. couldn't believe it. I was like, like, why would you capture these animals yeah. and exploit them? And I can't see any of those outside the net. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't just, you know, watch that. So what yeah. I did is I, I asked one of the captains to drive me there at night. And, you know, I close enough for me. I jumped into the water. I, I, I dive by myself towards that net and I cut the net open and I let all the animals escape and then the next morning the police were raiding all of the dive centers looking for whoever did this you know and I basically had to hide because I thought oh damn they're gonna they're gonna put yeah. me in check so long story short so that was my first kind of activist moment I would say you know what <laughs> well, I realized I cannot just watch what's going on. You know, I need to. And that's when I actively started looking for individuals, for scientists, experts, for organizations that are that are doing something for the ocean. And that was the key moment where it snapped. And I said, okay, I need to use my professional role as, as you know, a professional diver um, to do whatever I can to help. Yeah, definitely. That's so interesting. <laughs> bit scary yeah. <laughs> no it wasn't <laughs> I had to be done, yeah yeah and i wouldn't yeah. quite say i'm not an activist type i you know i believe in negotiation i believe in education i believe in positivity and inspiration in a way to make a change you know i, I i'm not generally not the one that would just like go out and you know kind of do whatever my emotions tell me in the moment you know mm. yeah anyhow Hmm. Um, okay, and um, did you get, because you, you worked with the Turtle um, Hospital and you do a lot of different other areas as well, um, did you get any additional education or training to uh, participate in different, in, like, different areas of research? Not at all, like strange enough. I do get that question quite a lot, you know, are you a scientist? <laughs> and sometimes... I'm, I'm having this discussion with my scientist friends. I'm thinking, oh, should I go on to get a degree? And everybody encouraged me and says, Christian, don't, you know? Because, you know, what I said before is like, I think once you found your superpower, you know, the scientist's superpower is the science, you know? Mm. And I think what, what I will have the biggest impact if I allow him to focus on his superpower by taking the other part away from him simply. You know, so it's almost yeah. again like the team that joining forces together um, because otherwise the scientist needs to do fundraising and he needs to do public speaking and he needs to document what he's doing, etc. Et so that's why you need other people. So I basically let loose of that. You know, I learned so much from the scientists and I love it. Um, but yeah, it would probably be more for my ego if I would have a science degree, you know. <laughs> so so I, yeah. I, do, I do focus, you know, if I do speak, look, like now, you know, if I do speak about scientific stuff, which I certainly, you know, I've done that all my life, but I definitely say clearly I'm not a scientist, you know, so I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not speaking on behalf of science in a yes. way, but I don't think I need to, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did not get additional education. And I keep thinking about it. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily like for you and for other people that are like talented in um, photography or media or any kind of like science communication. That's almost a, like as big an area and as needed um, as the science itself, because scientists are notoriously rubbish at communicating. 
what's going on. <laughs> yeah, and some are having... you know, the ones that are good, that they are, they are successful. You know, I yeah. work with a lot of those. They're very good at it. But there's most of them, yeah, it, it'd be better if they focus on the science, you know, as, yeah. as I said, and as you said, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, someone's asked, what's your camera setup and what's your underwater camera setup? <laughs> I've got quite a, quite a few. I just bought one <laughs> yesterday again. I'm, I'm oh, terrible. Nice. At it. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, look, <clears throat> I mean, I started off, you know, with little, it's more with the first of underwater cameras when they came out and kind of climbed up the ladder. And it, it was just later when I started to <clears throat> sort of get into, when I did get some commercial jobs, which kind of allow me again to be free to do what I do, you know, when, when I got, you know, shot or when I get, to shoot for Nachi or BBC or other productions. And that's when I had the necessity to have the high-end equipment. So, you know, that's when I purchased a, a red camera. And it's it's totally, yeah, out of most people's league. I don't even know how I made it happen. But again, you know, there was coincidences, but I had to be in a spot to shoot for Nachi and I needed that camera, you know, and, and they're very, very expensive cameras. But Kind of because I get to travel so much, I kind of need, it's almost like a crime not to capture it in that sort of timeless beauty, you know, that certain cameras can give you. Yeah. Still, you know, I'd say the most important advice would be what's the best camera in the world? You know, it's the one you have with you. You know, that is more important than having that, you know, that high-end equipment. Yeah, but I do shoot with a red helium. That's the 8K camera. I generally have that set up in the underwater housing. Um, I do have for stills, for very fast stills, uh, the um, Canon 1DX Mark II, which I just replaced yesterday by the 1DX Mark III. You know, that thing shoots like 20, you know, raw images per second. And I kind of, you need that for a certain wildlife conditions. Also the low light, the fast focus, all of that. Um, I do have a red, um, I, I, a black magic um, as well, the 6K. I have that generally set up with a microphone um, to to do sort of quick sound bites and top side recording. Um, so I basically I have everything set up. You know, it generally on an expedition, there's my underwater equipment. It's ready to go, you know, because there's the blue whale coming. I got like 10 seconds to get in the water, you know, and have it ready to go. So everything is always set up, kind of ready to go. So yeah. those are my three main cameras. And there's always a drone and there's always a backup drone. Yeah. So it's an Fire 2 as a drone with, in recording in RAW. And then there's a Phantom 4 or a Mavic Pro um, just to do that sort of quick, you know, quick grab of some more risky flights. God, you must be have so many bags when you're traveling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me about <laughs> yeah. That's pretty impressive setup, though. I guess with wildlife, you've just got to... Yeah, I mean, wildlife doesn't wait, so you've got to take your chance and go. You've got to be ready, you know, and there's some inspirational, like, filmmakers or photographers out there, like Paul Nicklin, you know, and his wife, um, uh, Christina Mittermeier. I mean, look at their photos. Like, it's inspirational, you know, and you always think, how did you get that? Yeah, <laughs> and the thing is, they're ready, yeah. They're there, they're ready. There's no destruction, you know. If, you, if yeah. there's a... If that animal is doing something crazy in front of you, you got to have it, you know. It's, yeah. um, exactly. it's that time I didn't have it. <laughs> yeah. Trust me that. Um, every time that happens, I go and buy that next best camera. <laughs> yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, what's your favorite underwater moment? Probably... But there's so, there so many, you know, I've, I've spent 20 years sort of uh, in the ocean and in the water and there's been a lot, especially sort of if I'm in a place where I've never been or no one almost ever gets there. But I mean, one on my last expedition just before the lockdown, I just I was in Mexico. We did blue whales and I tried sort of, you know, from year to year to get in the water with a blue whale and had many close opportunities but um, never made it. And this year I did, you know, I, I asked the boat to drop me. You kind of calculate the path of the blue whale. Visibility wasn't great. Um, I, I had to be in an area where I was permitted to go in the water as well. 
<laughs> and um, yeah, so I got dropped, and it was it was. Uh, I mean, I, I generally, have, you know, I'm very comfortable <laughs> in the ocean, but that it's kind of it's kind of weird. Visibility was very low. You know, I could I was looking above the water. I could see the whales coming towards me. You know, it's a blue whale. It's a bloody big animal. <laughs> and and I could see it, and I look underwater, and I couldn't see it. You know, I look above water, I'm like it's there, and I look underwater, I'm like I can't see it. And then it was <laughs> right in front of me, you know. And it's this moment that it was like it's real, you know. It's real. It's me. There's the whale. We look at each other. I, I knew that like, this moment is just gonna be um, like a big bucket list tick you know I would have never been happy in my life basically if I wouldn't have had this experience and um, definitely wow yeah it's just crazy this huge animal you know right in front of you and uh, God, that must have been uh, yeah. amazing yeah so that's that's a big I could tell you a lot of beautiful moments but a blue whale is kind of it's like a holy grail you know there's nothing bigger mm. yeah. ever crazy yeah. mm. so cool mm. um and have you would well you said that that was kind of like breathtaking but um what's your scariest have you ever had a scary moment underwater with wildlife or well even out of the water as well oh de definitely like with wildlife look it's i mean there'd be hmm. It's in our, look, there is time. I've done a lot of work with scientists, with sharks, you know, and big sharks as well, and tagging. And, there, you know, there's moments, you know, there's this one moment where I was surrounded by maybe like 50 bull sharks, you know, and I'm, I'm right in the middle and they're bumping into me. And there, there, there was a moment where I knew that now I'm not in control anymore. You know, I'm, I'm at the mercy of whatever they want to do now. You know, I kind of felt like... Oh, Usually I get, you know, I get extremely calm. This is the only way you, you kind of can do this as as a job. But that's where I realized, so, all right, now I'm definitely not in charge. I'm definitely not in control whatsoever. You know, I had this. But I'd say a scary moment was definitely one of them was a stupid moment early in my dive instructor days. Again, for my love of sharks. So that was when I worked in the Caribbean and... I was graving for moments because the ocean was so empty there. So I always got, you know, some locals told me, oh, there's a, it's called the, the um, Mona Trench between Dominican Republic and Costa, um, no, Costa Rica, uh, Puerto Rico. And, you know, there's believed to be lots of sharks in the channel. So anyway, so there was one day, water was clear. I had a dive master with me, took care for my group. I said, okay, you go there, I go the first stupid thing I went diving by myself you know it's the first rule but you shouldn't do but anyway you know I thought I'm I'm um, you know I'm invincible you know in a way mm. so, so I went there apparently there was supposed to be a ledge at about 60 meters that's the second mistake you know you shouldn't be that deep I shouldn't yeah. even say that I was deep anyway so I wasn't there <laughs> so I dove there so I was looking for that for that ledge, and I kept swimming 60 meters, 70 meters, 80 meters. I went down to 90 meters, and then I kind of realized something different. It felt like, you know, my head got washed between two buses. I turned around, and my breathing stopped. <clears throat> I couldn't breathe, you know, but I was fully conscious. So I was consciously drowning, basically. And um, I drowned, basically. And I was by myself. So I can't, I have no idea why am I, why am I alive? So the only wow. thing is at some stage I came back to me and I was in 40 meters and I have no idea how I got there. Wow. Yeah. But that so was, scary. I had a couple of scary moments, but that was really sort of in that stupid time where I was a dive instructor for a few years, you know, and I thought, look, you know, nothing can happen to me in mm. a way. And I pushed a limit. <clears throat> so, yeah, did, you have, mm. did you have to go into a um, compression chamber when you came back up to compression chamber? No. Um, no, I didn't have any. So maybe I should have, but there's none working <laughs> at country, so that, that wouldn't have helped. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But you had enough yeah. air and everything to get back up. Yeah. 
yeah that, that that wasn't a problem but yeah but other than that, look with animals now it's 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 almost like you know you and i think that's you know, if someone wants to get into underwater filmmaking or photography i mean my first advice be to spend as much time in the water you know, get comfortable with yourself and then you start to learn to get to know the animals you know observe them closely let them come to you yeah you know, etc and so it's kind of you start to get a very good feeling for and yeah, there's always animals that can surprise you but in general you you start you know let's say someone is into horses you know someone can probably walk straight up to a horse and the horse accepts you put your hand on in its head you know i probably can't do that because i'm not i'm not good with horses you know yeah it's but animal behavior do... isn't it like yeah. watching how the animal reacts and then reacting yeah. to the animal exactly but i can do that with a turtle you know i can see if a turtle wants me there or doesn't want me there and and yeah, you got to you look for little signs you know mm. so it keeps you safe and keeps the animal safe in a way yeah yeah um what is your most favorite part of your job i mean look dev i mean one thing it's it's clearly is amazing is i get to work with like not all, only like in the most amazing locations and extremely remote locations and see all this wildlife that's of course you know that is kind of what really sort of you know keeps my heart pumping in a way but it's also the amazing people i, I must say. i re- really think sort of in that job in that um conservation world you know, where people are in it you know for the right reasons it's because they're passionate because they want to make a difference and they want to do good and they want to dedicate their life to do good these are kind of the people you want to be with and want to hang out with there's such a there's such a good energy you know on these expeditions that uh you wouldn't want to trade that in for for anything you know it's yeah. just that you're wild and you're having these moments but there's there's a people that generally they appreciate these moments you know and i would definitely say that that's the people that i w- choose to work with you know specifically and yeah. they it's you can barely keep you know call it a job it's like it's unbelievable you know? yeah when you love your job so much that it's also your hobby <laughs> yeah wow, <laughs> it is um true. to balance that out though <clears throat> what's yeah. your least favorite part of your job if you have one and that <laughs> that's got to be standing in a queue at some airport at some line in the customs you know it's like that's the one thing that you know definitely a lot of people say oh you're so lucky you travel so much you know or whatever random conversations i oh, what do you do oh i just came from alaska oh my god you're so lucky and i think jesus you know <laughs> i just i didn't sleep for the last three days because i've been traveling i had to carry you know 150 kilos of bags through that i do not sometimes i felt like i live in in an airport i always <laughs> see my standing in a queue waiting for my passport to be stamped you know and just i keep standing that's every you know, every time i watch myself I'm like damn i'm here again you know and that is <laughs> yeah not, not a great part of the job you know yeah i like traveling to new places but i don't like the traveling part like the whole yeah. having to stand in queues in airports but obviously new places new cultures new environments yeah. amazing but the actual getting there is not nice <laughs> it can be awful yeah and sometimes it yeah. doesn't end either you know i go to from one place to the other it's just like ongoing you know it's, yeah anyhow yeah you know, it's a good and, problem <laughs> yeah it is a good problem to have um have you got a favorite <laughs> image or like favorite footage that you've ever taken like throughout your career mm ah uh, I mean the blue whale that's definitely something that I wanted clearly you know um the first time I I filmed orca that was nice where was that uh, Alaska nice that's I mean they're amazing animals is unbelievable um I'd say a moment or images that changed my um my way of photography 
it was clearly these images I took took of sea turtles, uh, and that was at that stage really to, I kind of wanted to show their character and 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 how beautiful they are, and that where I really sort of got my artistic side together with my photography, and I didn't have, it, it was. It's kind of weird. I remember when I took that first photo and just put it up in the social media and then there was media inquiries and there was obviously so much, um, you know, so much feedback coming. I remember the moment when I leaned back and, and I said, well, I think I'm on to something. I, 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 I really said that out loud. I said, I think I found something where I can really make an impact. Yeah. And that's where I just really worked on that style and, and these photos definitely kind of changed the way I think about photography. You know? And I can tell you what I've been thinking there. It was, I did a bit of studio photography and fashion and stuff. And I, I did realize this is not my thing, but mm. I learned to manipulate light and I learned to retouch, you know, and you can spend an entire day just to get that cover shot for a magazine. You know, you do endless retouching of, of you know, everything in the face and take this hair out and do this and this and that, you know? And I thought like you, people spend so much time every day to retouch a face, to sell <laughs> a, whatever, a beauty cream or whatever it is. What if I'd spend that time on an animal? And that's what mm. I did. I reached, I retouched a turtle's face to make it, to bring out its beauty, to make it perfect, you know? And, um, and that was, so I, I kind of combined what I've learned from one world into the other. And uh, I, yeah, I really enjoyed that. And that's set my path, I would say, as a photographer. Yeah. Yeah, I mm. mean, like, for anyone watching now, you can click on Christian's profile and you'll see the title photos that he's talking about. And it, yeah, they're, they're absolutely stunning. Like, really, really beautiful. Um, Thanks. Okay. Uh, what's the? Have you got like? Um, well, you've already kind of said the blue uh, whale one, but have you got any other projects like that have been like the most exciting project that you've been on or anything like that? Well, there's and so obviously there's that snot bot, you know, expeditions that I'm part of the team where we're collecting whale snot with drones. I mean, that is endless you know we all be a small team we always grave for the next expedition you know because we're just us together four or five guys always somewhere in the middle of nowhere and you know <laughs> we just spent 10 days 14 days you know out at sea every day all day long i mean there's nothing better than that you know but there's one thing i i, I was quite lucky i i got to go on a lot of trips with uh, an adventurer mike horn you know, he's sort of one of the sort of admired, you know, modern day um, explorers. You know, he achieved a lot of things that no human ever did. And, you know, we're really good friends. And I was very lucky to teach him scuba diving. And, you know, he sailed around the world and I joined him on all these expeditions. And mm -hmm. I was so I was meant to be right now with him in the Arctic. So he's in Svalbard. Um, so we were going to sail around Greenland up to the ice cap. And I had to cancel in last minute. I got permission mm. to leave, Australia, but I couldn't get into Norway. And I had to let that go. This is a trip of a lifetime, definitely. But with him, oh my God, we had some crazy adventures. Like, like think about, you know, diving in the Amazon, you know, in Rio Negro, zero visibility, you know, piranhas in there, you know, the, the <laughs> big dog. We're sleeping in the trees. You know, he's been teaching us survival techniques. I mean, that's... Or even like with him, you know, we crossed the Pacific Ocean and he would just look on a map and we just point the finger on a little dot. Then we scan in and, you know, find this little island. Maybe no one's ever been there. We look at the composition. Could it be interesting? And we just sail there and stay there for three days and dive and hike. And I mean, that's priceless you know what i mean yeah. it's, it, these are adventures that money can't buy that it's um, and yeah. that's what what i every time mike calls me i'm smart I'm, I'm vertically smiling for like weeks <laughs> up because there's always something exciting you know yeah that sounds amazing some incredible photography opportunities as well and 
Yeah, so he's got a young guy with a French guy with him. Man, I should almost send you a link to check out his photos. You know, he's got these photos now of blue whales as well. So that was meant to be my job. We were meant to collect whales not there. And um, he got this photo of a polar bear swimming in between the ice. That wow. photo, I could look at this photo hours every day. Like, it's just, like, you gotta, I, I gotta send you the link. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> Yeah. interview like this is beautiful mm. sounds amazing yeah very cool um and what's the have you had like a project that's been the most challenging for, for any reason it could be any reason um but anyone that's challenged you the most i wouldn't say in particular you know but the challenge of any project always is get it, it's always the same challenge it's first getting the funding you know, getting the money to do it, getting all the permits, you know, and aligning everything, you know, the team, the dates, the weather, etc. I mean, weather challenges you all the time. You've got to pick mm. very, you know, it's, there's no, there was never a single expedition which wasn't very challenging. And there wasn't, there was never one that we somehow made it work because everybody just gives their all, really. Mm. It's, a, it's a continuous cycle really but i couldn't pick one being more you know, even weather you know there's weather patterns generally you know they, you gotta allow three or four days you know for the weather to challenge you and you won't be able to make what you plan you do <clears throat> and that's always a cycle so you got to allow the time frames mm. It'll do it anyway. yeah and i guess with each project right you learn you learn something more with each project that you can bring to the next one, right? Yeah, you prepare yourself. Yeah, even with cameras. You know, it sounds ridiculous how many cameras I have, but look, I was just last week, I was, uh, we did a remote cleanup in Cape York. It's super heavy duty four wheel drive expeditions. You know, you challenge your cars. We, one of my cars is still up there. You know, we can't get it down yet. You know, so it's, um, we, we had several cars breaking down. You know, we had, I took four cameras with me and all four cameras played up, you know. Wow. Yeah. So you know, I had problems with my laptop. I don't know what it is, the moisture, the heat. <laughs> I don't know. It's, um, yeah. you, pre you, you prepare yourself, you know. Yeah. You have backup and the backup for the backup, you know. That's just... <laughs> yeah, layers of backup. <laughs> Um, okay, have you got any advice for, someone's asked about balancing your job in um, con conservation and photography with a family life. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I've got three daughters um, and it's, it's hard. Obviously now I've never spent so much time, you know, we've got a little one. Oh yeah. Like it's, I, I really take in every day because I never spend so much time um, with my girls but look the balance is uh, what I'm trying to do is I mean the first thing is you know as a as a father I mean you got to ask yourself you know is what is how, how you give your children the most you know and and that is by quality time you know and it's easier said than done but <clears throat> in that let's say little time that you have you can really do so much more take them on adventures rather than spending a lot of time together and just watch TV or whatever, you know? Mm. So I would definitely say I'm trying to make the most and uh, take them on adventures, you know? Yeah. Make the time but that yeah. you have with them count. Yeah. Just going to drink some water. Give me a second. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> yeah, so sometimes what I try to do, <clears throat> um, if I'm on an expedition and especially when I have to change plans and I have to extend, I'm trying to um, fly them in, you know, and spend oh, nice. some time and combine the both worlds. So some, I did that sometimes if it, if it's possible, you know? Yeah. Some yeah. incredible family holidays then <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, <laughs> And have you got any advice looking for anyone to work in a similar line of work, um, which I know yours is quite diverse, but <laughs> um, any advice look, uh, for anyone looking to do something similar? Yeah, look, I mean, my advice is, is a bit what, you know, what I said before is 
find your superpower at first, you know. What are you good at? You know, are you a, are you a designer? You know, are you an artist? Is your interest in science? Are you a storyteller? Do you, <clears throat> do you like photography? Whatever it is. And then, you know, I would look at what can you, what can you add, you know, to a project, you know. Yeah. That's what I would yeah. explore, really. Be proactive in a way. Don't, you know, don't just go to a project and say, you know, uh, can you tell me what I can do? You know, you, you go there and you say, I think I can do that for you. You mm -hmm. almost come with a plan. How you think you can help? Yeah. You know, adding, not taking attention away. From yeah. Good advice. <laughs> and... Um... Any camera advice uh, for people looking to get into wildlife photography? Um, that's a bit of a vague question, but I assume they're asking about, you know, kit setup, I guess. Or... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm the wrong <laughs> person to ask because I, I definitely <laughs> always get too much. Like, you know, I get, <laughs> I get it. I just make it work. Don't know. Don't ask me how. You know, I just buy stuff and then I make it work, you know, but I mean, I always get the best, you know. Is that a good advice? <laughs> Probably not. I'd say get what you can afford, you know, simply, but get the what you can afford. Yeah, like researching the, the, researching yeah. the rigs and stuff and making sure you're getting the best for your money, I guess. Yeah. And that, that depends also what you want to do with it, you know. Do you want to shoot wildlife? That's specific. You know, you gotta you gotta have something that's fast, some something that's robust, something that's you know, weather tight, you know. It it's it depends, you know. Yeah. Yeah. If you do you know, little videos or vlogs or whatever, that's completely different. You know, it it's mm. In some countries, I had to go really undercover. I had to come with little cameras. I couldn't come with a big production camera. Yeah, you know, they would stop you at the at the border you know, and ask, yeah. "What are you doing?" There, there's no, there's no real answer, you know, to that. I would say, but I mean, technology advances. It's crazy, you know. I mean, Canon just brought out the most ridiculous new cameras, you know, and you know, next year there's going to be something even better, you know, and with drones, it's the same thing. Like, it never yeah. ends, unfortunately, and that's the tricky thing, you know, what can you afford? I sometimes buy stuff I can't really afford, you know, but then I make it work, you know. I take on a job um, that I wouldn't usually take, maybe, just so I, I can pay for the equipment. Yeah. Yeah. Getting the best of what you can afford. Mm. Cool. Awesome. Um, so those were all the questions that we got submitted um, beforehand. I'm just going to have a quick look through. If anyone wants to ask any questions now, feel free to type them in the comment box below. Uh, someone said, have you ever dived in South Australia? Um, I have. Not, not as much as I'd, I'd like to, um, to be honest. But yeah, there is there's conversations in, you know, with Pali beginning sort of into um, the blue carbon sort of area in South Australia. Nice. There's, there's quite a lot of um, uh, research, there's leading research, you know, in terms of kelps, uh, mangroves, seagrasses, all of that. So it's definitely yeah. something I, I do want to... You know, they've they got those uh, sea dragons, the levy and the sea dragons, and they've got those big uh, cuttlefish. Um, so that's definitely something that I, I do want to spend a lot more time exploring this region. Mm. Yeah, sounds amazing. The sea dragons look incredible. I've seen photos of them. I've never seen them in real life, but they uh, look yeah. pretty incredible. Beautiful animals. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. We've got our quick fire questions. Uh, so people who are tuning in, um, feel free to submit questions um, that you want to ask Christian as we go through these ones. And we'll do a quick recheck at the end before we wrap up. Um, if you're happy, should we just jump straight into the quick fire questions? Sure. Awesome. So um, for people that haven't seen our Q&A series before, we ask all of our guests these questions, which are just fun questions, not necessarily related to conservation, but they're just, you know, um, a bit of fun to help us get to know our guests a bit better. 
Um, so, uh, first question, what's your favorite ocean creature? Orca, I would say. Oh, nice. Uh, favorite day of the week? I do not have one because I literally, believe it or not, I do reset overnight. <clears throat> so yeah. it doesn't matter for me. I don't get tired. I don't get fed up. I don't need a holiday. All of this. I just reset. Nice. Um, do you have a favorite plastic free or eco product that you can't live without? I show, I show it to you. I just drank out of it. It's my, <laughs> it's my, my water bottle. It got, it got my new design, my oh, Ella. That's the new book that I just finished. Um, so yeah, that's definitely, that's the one that I, you know, you know how, how awful you feel like when you're somewhere and you, you know, and you have to choose what you drink and they have just plastic bottles and then I just don't drink. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. uh, it's kind of not the best solution either, but I just can't, I can't, can't do it anymore. I can't take plastic bottles. Can't do it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I had that the other day. I had to use a plastic bag and I was like, Oh, this plastic bag's still going to be here in 400 years. <laughs> I don't want to yeah, use I this. Can't, I can't do that. You see me yeah. walking out of a shopping center with a tower you know, of, of product. In your I arms. Just I just can't see <laughs> the plastic bag now. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite beach in the world? Oh, goodness. Um, uh, I would have said a little beach on an island called Mork Island, which is one of the ones in the middle of the Pacific Ocean at the Mariana Trench the clearest water I've ever seen wow. and completely untouched because so far away from anywhere. Yeah. Sounds incredible. How did you get there? Boat? On the sailing boat of my friend, Mike Horn. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> nice. Um, uh, what was the last song that you listened to? Mm, probably Sean the Sheep because my... <laughs> My two-year-old daughter, she loves to watch that before she goes to bed. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, uh, dolphins or sharks? Tough one. Really tough one. Um, I, I'm definitely more fascinated by sharks. Sh you know, sharks, they got me. It doesn't mean dolphins got me any less than that. <laughs> no, that's just happen. Yeah. But yeah. Sharks. Sharks. Favorite holiday? I don't do holidays. <laughs> it's, 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 it's real. You know, everything is combined with, um, with a mission. Yeah. With a purpose, I would say. I couldn't just yeah. go on a holiday. Sorry, it's a boring answer, but it's true. I just can't. <laughs> no, I'm not a holiday so good. in a way. <laughs> That's all good. Um, would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to speak to animals? It's kind of obvious, is it? <laughs> that I definitely would want to speak to animals. Think about yeah. that. That'd be crazy. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. I literally had that thought because we have a lot of humpback whales here. And we were on the mm. boat the other day and um, this humpback whale was just like chilling. And I was like, imagine if we could talk to the whale and just like have a conversation about how his day's been. <laughs> yeah. They are so the founder of Ocean Alliance, who is a group that I work with. So they're actually looking into um, trying to understand the whale songs and trying to um, get deeper into it. Yeah, that's what we're, that's one of the areas of research we're doing. So we have a hydrophone and we deploy it, but yeah. um, we're still quite far off working out what they're actually saying. Yeah. And <laughs> it'd be much easier cool. if they just, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, if they spoke English. <laughs> have, you, have you seen that? I mean, we've been like in Alaska when we um, sampled the humpback whales and we, there was this one year, we had like a couple hundred of them around us and they were vocalizing, especially when they were, you know, group feeding, bubble net feeding, and you could, hear that through the hull of the boat it was you know you were like immersed into it and it was a, a pattern so you could literally hear what's happening now you know you could hear there's the caller he was calling out he's like oi, oi, and there comes the answer the group comes together and he's like oi, 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 and then you hear the <laughs> flapping of their flukes and 
um, you, you literally can hear it. And you, you do start to understand or kind of you know, yeah. what, what, what's about to happen, really. Yeah, we have um, mother. So we don't have any feeding that happens here, but it's all mating and mother and calf pairs. And um, the mother and calf pairs like do a drumming sound that's really, really loud. And on dives, you're like, I've had dives where your entire rib cage is vibrating because the drumming is just like so loud. And you're looking around like, where are they? I know they're near, <laughs> but they're so yeah. like, they'll always just be on the edge of the vis line, like just not quite be able to see them. Um, but it's, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like being able to, I was on a paddleboard the other day actually, and my friend was already out paddling and I was like preoccupied with standing up and, <laughs> and, uh, not falling in. And then I heard the blow, like, you know, that sound that's just like a, and I literally was like, where is it? Where is it? And I was like paddling, <laughs> paddling out to meet my friend and she was in, literally come up right by her board. Um, and she was a bit like, whoa, that was a bit closer than I thought they were. But um, yeah. yeah, like the, the noises are pretty incredible. Did you um, know that they keep changing? Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's all yeah, good. They, yeah, the sounds, they're changing. You know, basically, it's almost like a dialect. So one year they sing, let's say this year they sing, dee 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 da 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 And the next year he would just change one thing and he would sing, dee dee da da dee dee you know, and the next year yeah. he would change one thing again. It's believed as though, you know, when they're trying to be attractive to the female, they're trying to have the coolest song, you know, because they're, <laughs> they're acoustic animals. So trying just to be a little cooler, basically. Yeah. That's why the songs are continuously changing, apart from the sound pollution that we put in the ocean, obviously, as well. But yeah. um, it's quite, quite interesting. Yeah, Anyhow. one of our students just finished a product on um, the evolution of the humpback whale song in, in the area. It was some really interesting yeah. findings. Um, we've, we've worked out that we've got different pods coming through every, well, different pods, because we have loads of whales here. Um, we have different pods coming through every week um, based on the vocalizations that we're getting, um, which is pretty cool. Because we knew that we weren't really sure, because we collect fluke IDs, but... Um, to be honest, we're on quite a shallow shelf, so you don't get that many whales diving down, which means there's not that many fluke IDs um, to get, after, like, unless they're actually, you know, doing mob tailing behaviour or something where they actually yeah. have their fluke out of the water. Um, so, yeah, we're using the vocalisations to track the actual pods, and um, we've got pods moving through quite regularly, which is interesting because we weren't sure whether we had kind of like pods stopping here and then going back down south because we we're in a lot of warmer water or whether they were continuing up the migration route and yeah what the what the route looked like so we've been, we've been working with a few different ngos in five other countries um looking at their comeback whale song as well and then comparison comparing comparison between the pods yeah. um to look at how our substock is split basically around africa it's quite interesting stuff um, yeah. my research was always in sharks, but I've recently become more interested in humpback whales, so I'm slowly learning yeah. <laughs> the other we've stuff. Done a, <laughs> we've done a trip in Gabon a couple of years ago on the other oh, yeah. side. Yeah, yeah, we've been doing humpback whales there because that's a very um, understudied population of humpbacks on that side. Yeah, yeah, we've I been got working with. Working with... Yeah. We were working with um, a project in Namibia, um, but that was the okay. only project that we were working with on that side. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I got beautiful sound recordings from there. Amazing sound recordings, really. Yeah. It's the pretty enemy. amazing because there's, there's not that much, um, like, ships and stuff, especially at the moment with COVID, but there's not that many ships and stuff coming down the side. So it's quite nice having, like, unpolluted recordings. Yeah. Um, okay, sorry, right. got distracted. Um, <laughs> as a superpower, would you rather have teleportation or breathing underwater? Kind of obvious too, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I do dream that a lot. It ha I dream it so often. And it's, the mm. dream is so real that I, I, often, I wake up I don't know if I just had a dream or if it was real. You know, it feels so yeah. real for me to breathe underwater. Definitely yeah. want that. 
Yes. Um, and uh, what book would you take with you onto a desert island? I don't, strange enough, I don't really have time to read because I do so much other stuff. But if I had to, probably one of the survival books of my friend Mike Horn, because that would be quite handy to have. <laughs> Yeah, Some really, definitely. really good tips in there, how you survive. Yeah. Um, and what will be one of the first things you do when things get back to normal? Uh, I missed some amazing trip opportunities. So I definitely, when we ha once we have dates, I would definitely plan a trip to an amazing location. So just so I get it, I get it all back, basically, you know, for my passion. So there's a few, you know, even just West Australia, you know, I've been there, but not a lot. You know, probably want to um, go there. Uh, there's quite a few locations that I'm looking into. Papua New Guinea, I'd love to go there. So yeah. something maybe not too far. Um, but yeah, I've got two daughters that live in Boston. And obviously the first thing that I'll do is be able to see them again. Yeah. You know, we won't have seen each other for a year, which is a bit too long. Yeah, definitely. Traveling internationally, I think that's on a, a lot of people's lists. Um, yeah. Okay, and then last thing, why do you love the oceans? That's a, that's a tricky, you know, you would almost think, why would someone not love the oceans? You know, it's... It's, we are so dependent on it, you know, and I guess it's all the same for all of us. There's something about the ocean that gives you, that gives you peace. You know, I, I grew up in the middle of Germany, you know, far away from the ocean, but it was this once a year to the ocean that was the highlight of the year. And, you know, being dive instructor, you know, it was a, a dream come true. I didn't even know that you could work in the ocean and underwater. Um, where it comes from, look, I, I don't I don't know. It's a crazy fear of sharks that turned into obsession of sharks. <laughs> um, it's got to be, I don't know. Can't tell you where that, where that happened. Somewhere yeah. in, in my childhood, I suppose. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Um, okay, that's all the questions we've had, and we're um, nearing the end of our Q&A session. Um, do you have any upcoming projects or anything like that that you want to talk to our audience about? We've got two minutes left before Instagram cuts us off. Two minutes, <laughs> so. yeah. I, I mean, you know, a big thing for me, I planned my, my children's book about Ella the Sea Turtle. So that's the turtle that I took the photographs of, <clears throat> and I, I want to use it as a fundraiser for some projects, like one project in Papua New Guinea, one in Malaysia, um, where there's like amazing turtle, um, you know, education and relocation programs. So, yeah, I'm just trying to find ways of, you know, a lot of these projects, they're dependent on tourism and tourism dollar. They get that through resorts and the dive centers and they all don't have money now for, for their yeah. projects. I'm trying to find a way to raise um, funds for them with this book so that's um, that was a long and exciting journey so I'm just getting the proofs hopefully in the next few days it's be sent out tomorrow and then hopefully I can approve and then I have the book a few weeks later <clears throat> so I will ship them all around the world and hopefully they'll be inspiring some kids you know awesome. to love the audience just as much great um, so people that have tuned in, um, I'm just going to wrap this up quickly because we've got um, 40 okay. seconds until yeah. Instagram ends this live yeah. for us. Um, but basically, uh, if you missed anything, this will be available on our IGTV afterwards and also on our YouTube. Um, and feel free to um, PM us any messages. Um, you can, someone's just asked about the book. Um, Christian's got a link in his bio on his profile, so you can check that out there about the book. And you can also follow us both on our Instagram accounts. Okay. Thanks very much for joining us and for sparing the time um, and for chatting. <laughs> um, have a great evening. Thank you so much. And bye. Thanks.